and welcome to The Game Changers. I'm Sue Anstis and this is the podcast where I talk to the trailblazers in women's sport. What can we learn from their incredible journeys as we explore some of the key issues around equality in sport and beyond? A huge thank you to our partners Sport England who are kindly supporting the next three series of The Game Changers through a National Lottery Award. And what a privilege it is today to introduce my amazing guest. Sue Day was a legend on the rugby pitch, a former England captain at 15s and 7s. Sue played in three World Cups, helped win three Grand Slams and was England's top try scorer with 61 tries from 59 caps. She was made president of WAS in 2013, the first woman to hold that role in the club's 146 year history. And she's now Chief Operating Officer and Chief Financial Officer at the RFU. She's also a founding trustee of the Women's Sport Trust and has been an incredible driving force for equality across women's sport. So it was wonderful to see her recognised for this in 2020 when she was awarded an MBE for her services to gender equality in sport. So Sue, you didn't have the most traditional route into rugby. Can you tell us how you found the sport or how the sport found you? First of all, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's brilliant to be here. I went to a state school in the Midlands and the school that I went to, the boys didn't play rugby, let alone the girls. And so I just had never had a chance to see a rugby match or pick up a rugby ball. Uh, And actually, it wasn't until I went to university that, that I started to play at all. I did a degree in French and Spanish and I spent a year in Barcelona. And my first couple of years at university, I was playing hockey. And then when I got to to Barcelona, I couldn't find a hockey team or I certainly couldn't find a hockey team that I could afford to join. And a friend took me along to to rugby, picked up a rugby ball, absolutely loved it. And and the rest is history. I just just got bitten by the bug and never looked back. And what was it about rugby, do you think, over hockey? And I think you played netball a bit in the past to a fairly good standard. I loved all those sports and I, and I love all sports. I, I think I just found my home in rugby, the, the, the simplicity of the game. So it was about running quickly, evading people and scoring tries. It's really quite simple when you, when you hone it down. It just suited my skill set. So I got bitten by the bug. And then the other thing that, that I really found was certainly that team that I found in Barcelona. I was living hundreds of miles from home. I didn't really know very many people. I joined the rugby club. It was full of an amazing bunch of women and they just took me to their hearts. It, I found a little family there. And so I loved it from that perspective too. And, and, and indeed, you know, ever since moving back to university, then moving to London, my rugby team, my rugby friends have always been my, my family as well. So I, I, it was it was a combination of those two things. And do you think it'd be possible for a woman today at university or college to to find rugby and then progress through in terms of the quality of play to an England team? So I think it is probably still just about possible in the positions, I'll be careful what I say, in the (laughs) positions where less brilliant in, in the, all of the all-round all skill sets required. So be careful how it <laughs> it's easier to transition to be a winger if you've got brilliant fast evasion skills, but you don't need quite as so much of the distribution skills or whatever. I think it's probably just about possible, although I'm sure many current wingers might argue with me, but it's really hard. You know, but back when I played, so many people, you know, had just transitioned at university. Now that simply isn't possible because you've got people who have been playing since they were five, six years old and their skill set is just absolutely phenomenal. And, you, you know, you can't you can't learn that quickly. And that's what we want, really, isn't it? Ultimately, that is what you want is that quality of play that comes from, from playing throughout from childhood all the way through. I don't know if you mentioned that, but you came back to play at WASP. What was the setup like there for you as a woman playing at that time at WASP and then in England? Yeah, we, it was a, it was a totally amateur club. So we were players trying to be professional, you know, with a small P, but being totally amateur. So we, we trained on Tuesday and Thursday nights after the work or college or university, whatever it was people were doing. And we all paid a membership and we clubbed together to occasionally get a coach to go to the away matches. You know, so it was entirely amateur. And at the same time, it was a bunch of highly dedicated athletes and coaches trying to be the best they could possibly be so we were getting up early to do our training coming to club doing a quick skill session then doing the full session then finally getting to bed doing it all again the next day with work in between it was challenging 
Um, it was hard work, but it was amazing as well. Everybody was pushing after the same goal and giving it everything they possibly could. And how different is that today? I guess to paint that picture of, of women playing rugby today, whether at Wasps or, or in that England team. I mean, it's different in that there is a much more professional setup with a big piece. There's more funding, there's more investment going into the sport. And so you have some players, certainly the, the Red Roses, who are full-time contracted players who dedicated themselves to being the best rugby players they could possibly be full time. And there is a there is more investment in the infrastructure. So the coaching setup, nutrition, all those kind of things. You'd have more of that infrastructure around you. And at club level, there are still some players who are doing that juggling that, that we were always, always doing and, and arguably a lot more juggling now because they are trying to fit in more training sessions. They're trying to keep up with the players in their team who are full time, who want to be training more together. So it's a really, it's really important to acknowledge it's a really challenging moment for those players on the cusp of between amateur and professionalism who are trying to hold down full time jobs and be the best rugby player that they can possibly be in this system that is gradually going professional, if that if that makes sense. That's really interesting. I actually hadn't thought of it from that point of view, but how much harder it is almost when those around you and that you're playing against have made that step and we're not all on an equal playing field of everyone playing as amateurs. Exactly that. And it's really important you look after the welfare of those players because there's, you know, there's, t- there's two parts to it. They don't have the opportunity yet to be full-time professionals. They want to be the best they can possibly be. They'll probably feel under pressure from the other players to to be there more, but at the same time under pressure from themselves to to do more. And they're trying to work full time. And and we all know that the the thing that often gets forgotten in the middle of all of that is rest and recovery. If you talk to coaches in the AP15, they will tell you getting the balance right it's like teachers who are trying to differentiate with different you know, levels of, of learning in a classroom. They're trying to differentiate and create the right environment for all their players to thrive and to look after them. And your first full cap was in Spain. It's like some nice parity there, isn't there, yeah. in terms of that's where you found this, the game. But what are your memories of that day? You think back to that day. Oh, it's still hard to find the words because it's such a... The, the, that feeling of, of pride and, and achievement is, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard to put into words. I, I, I don't really know what I remember and what I've got in, in, in pictures, if, if you know what I mean. Yeah, that, yeah. There's a, I've got a, I mean, there isn't much left of the day. There isn't, there isn't a beautiful video of the whole match or anything like that. I've got a couple of pictures. It's one of me walking back after scoring my first try. So that's a memory I have, but I don't really know if it's a memory or just I've seen that picture a lot. What I remember are the feelings more so, the feeling of absolute nervous excitement the night before. I was sharing a room with Asunta de Biazzo. She was 12, I was 13. We took a picture of our shirts next to each other. Just that feeling of the build-up, the excitement, how special it is. And then I just about remember the match, but then after the match, I remember there were quite a lot of people who made their debut that game. And in those days, they, they, they may still do it. I don't know, the, the senior players presented each new cap with a rose then we all stood together with our roses and had a picture and I just it, it's really the feeling more than the match itself that I remember just that feeling of excitement of pride so nervous as well all, all of that mixed in together you were also in that first England women's team to play at Twickenham too so again memories of that day that must have been incredibly special too Yes, that was against France in 2003. We, we played at Twickenham and, and you, you're right, just to, just to run out at Twickenham Stadium, the home of England rugby, that felt really special f- for a number of reasons. It's an amazing stadium to get to play in, so just that feeling of, of, of awe when, when you run out. But also really importantly in those days as well, the feeling that it meant that people believed in us. You know, we had previously played in all sorts of places, you know, and and wherever you you go around the country to play, clubs will absolutely look after you and help you feel welcome. But the feeling of acceptance from the rugby uh, hierarchy, if you like, or the rugby community when we got to play at Twickenham was really important to us because, you know, the, the international women's game had come a long way by that point. They'd had to fight for everything that they possibly could to, you know, to get to where they got to. People like Carol Isherwood, Deborah Griffin put in so much work to create the game at all that it really felt like a huge, a huge step that we've made to get to Twickenham. 
And you excelled and played at 15s and 7s too. So for those perhaps not as familiar with the game, how easy is it to play him and be brilliant at both? And you captained both too, didn't you? Yeah, my skill set fitted a little bit. So uh, the it's important to have absolute speed in sevens apart from fitness and everything else. If you don't have speed, you'll, you'll get found out. So that, that definitely helped. What I definitely did, which I wouldn't advise to people, I, I played seven at the end of my career. So ordinarily, sevens is often played by young players coming through very, very <laughs> fit with a lot of energy because it is incredible. I mean, 15s is hard work. 7s is hard in a different way. You essentially sprint in the sun as much as you possibly can. And it, it just, it really hurts. The mental toughness in 7s to be able to just do sprint after sprint after sprint is, is so important. So, yeah, ordinarily you do that early in your career and then you then you sort of graduate into, into 15s. I played it right at the end of my career and that was simply because that's when the opportunity arose the first ever Women's Sevens World Cup was in 2009. And I'd actually retired from 15s and I was sort of planning to retire. But then this tournament came along. As I say, it fitted my skill set. There were a load of young players they wanted in the Sevens. And there was just a really, really nice role for me and for Joe Yap to be the, the older players helping this generation come through. So just a brilliant opportunity at the end of my career. And, you, you know, you're always in life looking for ways to do new things and learn new things. It meant it ended my international rugby career really nicely because I, I learned a load of new skills th- through sevens. Um, and it was just a lovely way to, to cap off my international career. I've been really lucky on the podcast to talk to lots of national captains, actually, in netball and cricket and football, hockey. And I'm always interested to know what they think makes a good captain. So why do you feel you were chosen for that role and what, what do you feel you did well? I mean, it really depends, doesn't it? People can absolutely be all sorts of different kinds of of captain. My role in that team was to bring some experience. Players now who you wouldn't think of as as the younger players, but people like Rachel Burford, Nolly Waterburn, Heather Fisher. We're just reading about, you know, people like Nolly, Heather, you know, retiring not so long ago. So so it dates me. But but, but all those young players coming through, and, and so they didn't have that much international experience. And so my role, first of all, was to help create an environment that they felt comfortable in, that they felt included in, where they felt they could thrive, and to help take the pressure off them. So, you know, they, they, all they had to think about was playing rugby, being the best they could possibly be. The other really important role I think we had was, was just to set the right example, to be a role model of what an international player should be. I always talk about you want to be the best role model you can be even when nobody's watching like you're 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 doing all the right things in the right way you, you're behaving with integrity you're doing all your training sessions you're listening to the coaches you're treating people respectfully all of those things that go together to be you know the full package of a of a really well-rounded international rugby player the whole of society is crying out for good role models and i think sports people have this you know, amazing opportunity if they want to take it to, to be those kind of role models, to act with integrity, to, to be the best that you can possibly be. You were playing rugby in the 80s and 90s when society wasn't as progressive as it is today. So what was your experience like being an LGBTQ woman in rugby? That's a really good question. The honest answer is that it was easier to be an LGBTQ woman in rugby than not in rugby. It was a really inclusive space to be. I found rugby, the rugby club, to be that space where it was okay to be who you wanted to be, where you didn't have to hide who you were or you didn't feel like you had to hide who you were, where I certainly always felt supported by my teammates, by coaches, by, by people around me. So I appreciate that. That can be, you know, that experience can be really different for different people in in different sports, certainly different, you know, certainly harder for for men in, in sports rather than women often to, to, to be out. But but my experience was that it was it was such a welcoming, inclusive place to be. How do you feel about sport today? I kind of had my own positive opinions, you know, as a mother of a rugby playing daughter, but what, what are your thoughts in terms of how the sport is today? In terms of inclusivity, I mean, I think the first thing to say is there is always more to do. If you think you're in a team sport or any sport and you think you've made it, if you think you've done enough to include people, then, you know, you're wrong. There is always more to do. I I personally think rugby 
is in a relatively good a good place. I, I generally find rugby clubs inclusive places, and I generally find rugby people open to thinking about how to make them more inclusive. I appreciate all of those generalisations. We know there is always more work to do in every club in the land, within England rugby, everywhere. We have to constantly be striving to be better. And yeah, we've never made it. Uh, that's absolutely the right approach, isn't it? Absolutely. I hate to bring this up, but you played in three World Cups, but didn't, <laughs> didn't win one. How much does that matter to you now when you look back at what was clearly an extraordinary career? So, yeah, I mean, the, the answer should be that it doesn't it doesn't matter at all. I gave it my very best and I'm very proud of what I did achieve. All of that's true. I am very proud of what I achieved. I did give it my all. And we were competitive people who got out of bed every day with pretty much the sole goal of winning a World Cup. So I will remain disappointed forever that we, we didn't win the World Cup. That's what we were trying to do. People, you know, often talk about... The, the parallels between sport and business, running organisations. And, you know, I think you can overdo those comparisons. But I do think one thing business can learn from sport is, you know, in sport, you have such a clear, simple clarity of goal. I got out of bed every day knowing that I was trying to do the best I could to be the best I could be as part of a team that was trying to be the best it could be to win a World Cup. And the more that you can replicate that clarity of goal, the, the better in any you know walk of life. And so I, yeah, I, I am, I am proud. I'm, I, I'm deeply fulfilled by the rugby career I had, the friends I made, the life lessons, I, you know, all the things I learned. And I will remain disappointed forever that we never won the World Cup. And like me, you're a founding trustee at the Women's Sport Trust, and you've supported the charity for ten years now. Can you just tell me why you got involved in, in 2012? Yeah, well, yeah, sort of two parts of that answer. Uh, why I got involved was because Tammy Parler, one of the founders <laughs> and who is still uh, chief executive of the of the charity, essentially hunted me down on Twitter and got me involved. She's very tenacious. I'm, I'm an accountant by trade. Out of the bottom of the email, the fact that I was and where she realised that, that could be quite helpful in the in the start of a bit of a charity. So that coming together with the fact that I was I was just retiring from playing sport. I'm deeply passionate about sport. I care about sport. I have really strong feelings about how much sport can bring to people's lives. And so really want, really want to make sure that as many people as possible get the chance to be touched by sport. And the fact is, the fact was then, and it still is, that women and girls do not have as many opportunities in sport as, as men and boys. And so when, when she came to me with that concept, it just fitted perfectly with the moment I was at in my sport career, the passion that I have. And, and, and so I got involved and here I am. Yeah. As you say, nearly 10 years later, like you still involved because we've achieved so much. It's so exciting. And as we keep saying, there is still so much to do. do and, <laughs> and when you stop playing, you coach the England women's development squad for a while and, and WASPs too. So what's coaching profession you ever considered taking for, as a full-time role? Oh, that's a great question. I certainly wanted to dip my toe into coaching. And I, I don't think I knew at that point whether it was something that I wanted to pursue as a career or not. I just sort of tried it out a bit. And what I found or what it reminded me of, because, you know, if you think about it, I've been coached for a long time. So I should have known exactly what it, it took to be as a coach. But, but what I found was to be a really good coach is you have to be so dedicated even the, the England Sevens development team I coached had, I had 10, 12 people and Joe Yap had 10 or 12 in the talent transfer team together. They were sort of one squad. And even just a squad of that 10 or 12 people to, to genuinely to help them be the best they can possibly be. You know, you need to be watching them play. You need to be doing individual feedback for each of them. You need to be helping them to be better players. You need to be helping them to be better people. They need to bring all that together. The, the, the amount of dedication and commitment that takes is, is huge. And so I realised that I either had to throw myself in it 100% or not do it at all. And at the time, you know, I had been working at KPMG the whole time that I that I was playing for England. And I was just back into working full time at KPMG and actually want, really wanted to give that career a go. And so it just wasn't 
for me, it just wasn't a possibility to do the two because I couldn't do the coaching. I couldn't commit enough time to the coaching to be brilliant at it. Do you think you might have done if it, there had been a pathway and an opportunity in terms of being a professional role as there is more of now? Yeah, I might, I might have done. And, that, and that's one of the issues I think that we face in women's sport still is that women get to the end of their sporting career. And, and you know, this is true for some men in some, in, in some, in some sports too, but, but true in most women's sport. You get to the end of your, your sporting career and, and suddenly, you know, that, that you've got to think about the rest of your life. And, and so you need to make sure you look after your non-sporting career. So we lose women out of brilliant women out of sport for that because they need to focus on other things. This isn't true of men. You've often not put off starting a family because yeah. you just couldn't do it while you were playing. I mean, I played with a couple of women who did juggle the two and goodness me, hats off to them. And just on top of that, women generally have more of the family caring, all of those responsibilities that men don't so much have. So you put those three things together. It means that women you know, as they reach the end of their sporting career, have a lot more pressures. And so we tend to lose them out of sport at a greater rate than the men at that point, because they're just so many other things that they, they they might need to take care of. And as as leaders in sport, that is a huge problem we have to fix because, you know, to be the best sports that we can possibly be, we need to keep those women in our sports because they are brilliant. What they know is gold dust. If we can recycle that knowledge and expertise, you know, think how how much better will be. And how important then is it to see the likes of amazing Giselle Mazer, Susie Appleby, Nikki Ponsford, I could name many of those women coming through as coaches now and and having that profile? It's so important. And it's important for for all sorts of reasons. It's important because it shows the opportunities are there now. And just just because women should have those opportunities in the same way that men do. It's also important because we want role models. We don't just want role models on the pitch I want little boys and girls to turn on the telly and I want them to see women on the rugby pitch playing rugby I want them to see women on the sidelines coaching rugby I want them to see women in the middle refereeing rugby I want to hear I want them to hear women in the background talking about the rugby commentating on the rugby all those kind of things but just because I want those little boys and girls to grow up thinking oh women can do that stuff too I've got <laughs> I've got friends who've got um, a, a young son and he'd grown up watching their friends play rugby and he turned to his mums one day and said when they went to see a men's rugby match what do men play rugby too you know <laughs> just just it's just you know kids can grow up just thinking all of this stuff's normal then you know we will be redundant at the women's sports trust because all this stuff will be sorted. We're done. And um, why did you take the job at the RFU? Did you ever question working in the, the very sport you loved or did it just feel like a dream opportunity? Yeah, I didn't question it all that much. Maybe, maybe I should have, but it, yeah, it was, it was one of those once in a lifetime sliding doors, whatever you want to call it, m- moments in time. I wasn't looking... To, to to move. I was at the time I was working at KPMG. I was a partner in the deal advisory business. I had a leadership role in the deal advisory business. I had loads of opportunities. I was really enjoying my job. But one day a fellow partner forwarded to me the job description for what, what the, the job I started here at, which was uh, chief finance officer at the RFU. And he forwarded it to me saying, you know, you know finance, you know rugby, can you think of anybody? who might be interested in in this. And I I took one look at it and I thought, actually, do you know what? Yeah, I I do know one person who's really interested in this. And and the reason I was interested was, well, I mean, everything I've just talked about, you know, rugby has given me so many of the most amazing experiences I've had in my entire adult life. It's taught me so many life lessons about how to fail and get back up again, how to work in teams, how to give feedback, how to receive feedback, how to constantly strive to be the best that you can be. All of that, you know, it could go on forever. And, you know, I have got so much out of rugby and to have the chance to shape that, to to be able to influence the shaping of that sport that that I love so much. It was just such an amazing opportunity and I couldn't, you know, I have, I I had in the past sat outside the RFU and perhaps criticised it from time to time for things it may or may not have done. You know, and sometimes you've got to put your money where your mouth is, haven't you, and give it a shot. And the plan is that England could potentially host the Women's World Cup in 2025. Where are we in that process and what do you think that could mean for, for the women's game? 
Yeah, so we're in a process um, with World Rugby, which uh, I hope I get this right, should conclude in, in, in May. So we'll know for sure whether, we, whether we're hosts in, in May. We really want to host this tournament. We just think it can be part of such a catalyst to take the women's game to the, to the next level. So I, I talk about it in terms of Twickenham Stadium, but this is about the whole of rugby. It's about getting more people playing. And just that, you know, you think what we want to do is aim to fill Twickenham Stadium for a Rugby World Cup final. 80,000 people, all different different shapes and sizes, different ethnicities, all genders, all ages. Such a diverse, exciting set of people watching the game. A stadium full, teams running out, anthems playing, hairs going up on the back of your, of your neck. For me, that's just an amazing metaphor for where the women's game can get to. It's going to help rugby attract whole new audiences it's going to get so many little boys and girls interested in the sport watching and then hopefully playing it's going to get sponsors and broadcasters interested all of those things there's just so much opportunity there to take women's going to the next level I remember sitting with you at lunch at Twickenham a few years ago ahead of an international double header and the man giving the pre-game speech and I won't name names but man managed to forget the accomplishments of the female players in the room and he talked about the men England men and their captain he didn't even get the name of the country right in terms of who the women were playing that afternoon and you were so calm and the other women at the table were ready to call him out and you were really patient so is that how you feel you've had to be in that senior role at the RFU? Gosh, that's a question. That in I, I, sometimes. So uh, the, the the RFU, <laughs> the RFU brought me in as 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 CFO. So it knew what was it was getting. I, you know, that there, there has been a will here to to take the game into the next century, to to, to take the women's game into the next level for for a really long time. And they they brought me in to to try to be part of that. And they certainly wouldn't have done. Have done that if they didn't if they didn't want to take the game to the next level. I think in all walks of life in all places, there's there's two ways to to come at issues like that. What sometimes you need to make them head on, you need to call it out, whatever the right word is. And other times you need to sort of understand where it's come from and, and use it as a learning opportunity, have conversations with people and make sure it doesn't happen again. In that instance, I took I took the latter option. In other instances, I've taken the former option. I think it's often a the call you need to make in, in certain times, isn't it? But it's it's definitely an easy conversation to have. That's what I've loved being in this role and this organization in this game. I genuinely find that people want to want to know. It's never a different conversation to have. So did you did you know you just you know you just miss this out of that out. and people will we want want to be more inclusive we want to be better we want to get more people involved kids playing etc so but yeah I think I think a combination of approaches and how important do you feel male allies are for driving that change in women's sport and are there enough of them in rugby and I, I guess I through my own involvement I, I do feel as you've said it's been very positive in terms of what I've seen within the RFU but do you feel across rugby uh, there's enough support there for the women's game I, th- I think so. so. So the first part of your question was how important are male allies? And I think I think really important, but they need to be active allies. They need to be advocates. They need to be really got to be pushing in the same direction and, and really and really pushing the game forward, not just sort of talking about it. So I think active allies, you know, we can't do it on our own. We need the whole the population of rugby to be pushing this forward and to be shouting about it. Are there enough? I, I'm no, because there are never enough, are there? And in 2016, you spoke to Tammy. We've mentioned Tammy a couple of times here on her podcast. And she asked you what was needed for the future success of women's rugby. At the time, you said visibility, funding and a strong product. Is that the same six years on or, or what kind of, how do you think things have progressed since then? Yeah, I totally agree with myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's exactly that because they're the sort of the legs of the stool, aren't they? You create an amazing product and then broadcasters want to broadcast it that means that people get to see it. People get to see it um, and it's on the telly. Sponsors want to sponsor it. That creates more money, which you can then reinvest back in a, in a great product. And, and so the virtuous circle goes on. So I, I think we're exactly there. If I, if I had to pick one of those things, it would be the visibility because I think that's what drives everything else. You know, let's get our game in front of as many people as we possibly can through streaming, on the telly, whatever it might be. 
and that's because I've got a huge belief in the product. You, you know, you and I have talked about this. There have been some amazing AP15s matches this season, last season. It, it, it already is a great product. Of course, it can be better when we invest in it more and so on. But let's get this game in front of as many people's eyes as, as, as we can, because when they see it, they'll fall in love with it and, and we can take it to the next level. And just finally, what will it mean to you when we do fill Twickenham for a women's game? Goodness me. I, it's so, it makes me smile just thinking about it. I, can, I can't really answer it in, I can answer it in feelings. It will feel, it will feel amazing. It will feel like we've, we've made, I, I, I talked about it earlier. You go back to people like Carol Ishwood and, and Deborah Griffin and the work that they put in to take a few people, a few women playing rugby and turn it into a nascent England team and, and to take it from, from that to full Twickenham, a professional team playing in front of a, a full stadium with it, it, it would it, it, it means that we've we've made it it means that little boys and girls everywhere will be able to see those inspirational players playing you know and it means that the the future is is so bright for the game the world is is rugby's oyster when we've made it there so i don't think i've answered that question very well but it's be such a step change for the game as always, it was such a joy to talk to Sue Day. I know so many people across sport hold her in the highest regard and I'm so grateful that she made the time to talk to me. Do visit fearlesswomen.co.uk where you can find out more about all of my incredible guests from this and the previous eight series. You can also listen to all the podcasts on the website and find out more about the Women's Sport Collective, a network for all women working in sport. You can sign up for Changing the Game, our free weekly newsletter, which highlights the developments in women's sport. And there's more about my new book, Game On, The Unstoppable Rise of Women's Sport, also available in all good bookshops. Thanks again to Sport England for their backing of the Game Changers through the National Lottery and to Sam Walker, who does a great job as our executive producer, along with Rory Ouskery on sound production. And finally, thanks to my brilliant colleague, Kate Hannon, who does so much behind the scenes at Fearless Women. Do come and say hello on social media while you find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram and Facebook at Sue Anstis. The Game Changers. Fearless women in sport.